The story of computer vision starts in the early 60s. Back then it was a big deal if a computer could distinguish between a circle and a square. But in 1966, something interesting happened. Professor Seymour papered had a vision, quite literally. He launched what became known as the Summer Vision Project. The goal? Well, build a computer able to identify objects in images. Papert and his team were optimistic as they thought they could solve this challenge in just one summer. Well, probably they were off by about 50 years. But that summer project, despite the fact it did not achieve its ambition goals, it is now recognized as the moment computer vision was born. It set the stage for everything that followed. Fast forward today and look what we are now. Self-driving cars with advanced vision systems, AI-powered drones that can spot defects, think also of system tracking thousands of people in real time, and robots that do not just see, but also interact what they see. The applications of computer vision seem endless, touching everything from business operations to the phones we carry in our pockets. So the least we can say is that the journey from that ambitious summer project to today's vision systems is remarkable. But how did we get here? How do machines actually see and understand our visual world? And what does it mean for managers and their businesses? Stay tuned because today we're looking into that. I'm Hamid Nash and welcome to a new episode of eCompass. So what exactly is computer vision? Well, it's a field of AI that allows computers to see and understand images and videos just like our eyes and brains do. Think of it this way. When you look at a cat, your brain instantly recognizes it as a cat. But for a computer, that image is just a bunch of numbers, millions of pixels. So the idea behind computer vision is not just about comp capturing images from a camera, it's about understanding their meaning. And this journey, well, it's been a long one. So it started back in the 1960s. Take Lawrence Robert, for example. His work on finding edges opened the door to what we now call feature extraction, which means identifying elements like lines, corners, and textures in images. He basically showed that, indeed, computers can understand shapes. Then came David Marr in late 70s, who brought a fresh perspective as he stepped back and asked, before getting into systems, how do we humans actually process what we see? As a neuroscientist, he believed that if we can understand our own vision, we can teach computers to do the same. So he came up with this three-stage process of vision. First, catching edges and basic features, then figuring out vets and surfaces, and finally building complete 3D models in our minds. His ideas were game changer and are still used today. Now, fast forward to 1986, and we get another breakthrough, the canny edge detector. John Canney, who is an Australian computer scientist, figured out how to make computers find clean, precise edges in images. But here's the thing. While this was impressive for its time, it was still working within the framework of statistics and rules, which obviously was unable to fully capture the complexity of the real world. So it became clear that the field of computer vision needed something more sophisticated. Then came the 90s and there was an important development with Yann Lucan who used neural networks. Well, Lucan developed the first functional convolution neural network to process images. Convolution neural network, or CNN, were good at images because they used a technique called convolution, which is like having a tiny magnifying glass that scans the picture piece by piece, searching for patterns, edges, or shapes. Lucan's model outperformed all other models in reading handwritten digits. So while this might sound simple today, it was groundbreaking at that time. But like many breakthrough ideas, it was ahead of its time because the computer power and data needed to fully use CNNs just wasn't there yet. The good news is that Lucan's work not only paved the way for the development of future CNN models, but also for commercial applications, particularly in optical character recognition, or OCR. For example, Lunette was introduced in the banking sector as ATM machines in the early 90s were able to read the amounts on checks. The early 2000s marked the rise of machine learning. Here's what happened. Computers became faster and researchers had access to massive image libraries like ImageNet. This combination opened the door to great possibilities, which is teaching machines to identify objects in images. 
Researchers tried different approaches, and one that stood out was support vector machines, which was developed back in the 90s by Vladimir Rapnik and Corina Cordes. SVM was good at sorting images and detecting objects, and we could say that machines were finally started to see. But there was still a catch. These systems weren't as automatic as they seemed. Scientists had to tell the computer what elements to look for in the pictures. For example, if the task is to identify a cat, the instructions would be look for pointy ears, a tail, a whiskered face, a rounded body shape, and fewer. But you can't create those detailed instructions for every object in the world. What about a fruit, a forest, a fire, or a cloud? So, Yes, the machines could learn, but still they relied heavily on humans to decide which features to look for. What the field really needed was something smarter that could figure out these important features on their own. The breakthrough came in 2012 as deep learning and convolutional neural network converged. It began with AlexNet, a model developed by Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Satskever, and Geoffrey Hinton. This model was a game changer. It could learn features like edges and shapes right from images on its own, without relying on human inputs. From that moment, the evolution of computer vision just took off. Today, modern computer vision systems, especially those based on deep CNN, can automatically detect and learn features from data on their own. Today, machines moved beyond simply identifying objects. They started detecting and segmenting and even understanding entire scenes in real time and applications have flourished across industries, from facial recognition in smartphones to innovations in medical imaging. And as we all know now, we even reached the point where AI can create images like DALI and Majani. So how does modern computer vision actually work? Let's break it down with an example. Imagine you have a picture of a guitar. The system starts by detecting simple edges and lines in the image. These are low-level features. Then it combines the edges into meaningful shapes, the long neck with its fret patterns, the curve of the body, the circular hole, and the headstock. These are mid-level features. Next, the system compares these patterns to what it has learned during its training, and it concludes, this is a guitar. So this is the high-level understanding. So it builds up from simple edges to complex understanding. That's the idea. So where exactly do we see computer vision today? Well, computer vision is everywhere. In manufacturing, it's used in, on production lines with AI-powered cameras that can spot defects in real time. In healthcare, it analyzes medical images like X-rays and MRIs with accuracy. The transportation sector is evolving too, as computer vision acts as the eyes of the self-driving cars and trucks. This is made even more effective with LiDAR systems, which provides precise 3D mapping. In warehouses, smart cameras and robots are making inventory management much more efficient. And in retail, computer vision powers everything from self-checkout systems to augmented reality shopping experiences. On farms, AI-equipped drones monitor crops to detect any potential issues, while the food processing industry uses it to sort and grade products. Computer vision has also enhanced public security. In real estate, AI vision tools analyze property photos and videos to identify issues like cracks or structural problems. The financial sector is also finding value in computer vision, as it uses it for processing checks and detecting fraud. And in the insurance industry, it's used, for example, for assessing claims through pictures analysis. Entertainment is benefiting too, with computer vision powering augmented and virtual reality experiences that are changing how we interact with digital content. In sports, it's used to track every player's movement during a game, providing detailed insights and analytics. So the possibilities are endless and it keeps growing. And as the technology develops, definitely we'll see even more creative applications. So what does it take to actually deploy computer vision in your organization? Well, it all starts with a clear business intent. What are you trying to achieve? Are you looking to streamline quality control, enhance customer experiences, optimize production lines or improve safety. Obviously, defining a business goal is critical because it shapes every decision that follows. Then you need data. Computer vision systems require hundreds, sometimes thousands of labeled images to learn their tasks effectively. For example, if you're sorting fruits, your data might have images labeled by type, size, or defects. If you have a small set of images that might not be enough to train your model, you can use the data augmentation to generate more images by tweaking existing ones, like flipping, rotating, or cropping. 
And if you have extremely large data set, say millions of images, labeling everything might be impractical. In that case, semi-supervised learning can help as you can label a small portion, say 10%, and letting the system learn patterns from the rest. After data comes the model and tools. Once you've got your data sorted, it's time to choose your model approach. And there are three main paths managers can take. First, there are the pre-trained models, which are ready to use off the shelf. This comes in two flavors, proprietary solutions like Amazon Recognition or open source options like ResNet or YOLO. But what if you need something more tailored? Well, that's where fine tuning comes in. We talked about fine tuning in the previous episode and you can refer to that. But here's the thing. Let's say you are a manager in manufacturing a company and you need to spot defects in bottles. You can take a pre-trained model and fine-tune it with your specific images of defective bottles. The model already knows how to see, you're just teaching it how, what to look for. Finally, there is the custom approach, which is building a model from scratch. It's relevant for managers dealing with unique challenges like analyzing satellite imagery or pipeline defects in oil industry or something more complex. And there are tools out there like TensorFlow and PyTorch that can help build those custom models. Once the model is ready, well, it's time for deployment. This step involves integrating the computer vision system into the organization processes. Finally, there is the continuous improvement. Real-world conditions can change and will change, and your system needs monitoring and retraining as new data becomes available. Well, despite its many advantages, computer vision is not without challenges. One of the biggest issues is the potential of bias in the data used to train the models. If the training data is not representative of the real world, the model may learn to make incorrect or biased decisions. For example, a facial recognition system trained primarily on images of white Caucasian men may struggle to accurately recognize women or people of other races. This can lead to unfair or discriminatory outcomes, which is a serious concern in applications like law enforcement and hiring. Privacy and security are also major concerns, especially when it comes to facial recognition and surveillance. There are real concerns that these technologies could be used to invade people's privacy. But overall, computer vision can have a positive impact and it continues to make significant advancement and more and more companies are using the technology to enhance their processes. And the future of computer vision looks promising too. For example, edge computing is making real-time vision more affordable. Edge computing means that data is processed closer to where it is collected, such as directly on cameras or sensors, instead of relying on cloud servers, which just adds the, to the computing resources and latency. Self-supervised learning is another game changer. It can allow a computer to learn by providing them with just a very few images. This can help reduce the need for extensive label data set, making computer vision more accessible for businesses of all sizes. So we've come full circle from that ambitious MIT summer project to where we are today. The world has not only realized their vision, but it's pushing far beyond it. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I'm Hamid Nash and see you in the next episode of eCompass.